Welcome to Decision, Decision space, space, the only show to take place right here in the space between the turns in your favorite games. I'm Jake Friedman. And I'm Brendan Hansen. And this is the podcast about decisions, decisions in, games. in games. And in today's episode, we're talking all about progression. We'll talk about progression systems. What makes us feel like when we're playing games, we're progressing in them. And also, we'll talk about other things people might mean by when they say progression. Like, how do we sense experience a sense of progress through a game being played as all games progress from a beginning to an end. So we're going to unpack, get in under the hood of the, the term progression and talk about the different ways that people use them and maybe ha filtering that, of course, through our decision space lens. Um, but yeah, Jake, how are you, how are you doing? And I'm doing really good. Uh, summer, for sure. We've just been having an absolutely beautiful few days here in the Midwest. Like, I was actually chilly in the morning on like a June 30th. So oh. just completely uncharacteristically beautiful. Uh, so I've been getting out playing some disc golf, playing some kickball uh, back with my old team in Kansas. And it's been an awesome few days. How about you? Nice. That's that's amazing. I have not been playing kickball or disc golf. They both sound delightful. Um, mostly just been like jamming, trying to stay in the groove of having two kids under three, one who's turning four months in a couple of weeks, which is mind blowing. Um, playing a lot of Captain Flip with Maya and a, a little bit of My City, but just kind of, kind of, you know, in the groove of it. But speaking of being in the groove, we've been getting a few reviews since we called for reviews a few weeks ago. And we're going to read out another one on the show as we want to do. And beyond read out, we're going to review it. We're going to review Hill... Side Council's review of Decision Space. So this review is titled Clean Thinking About Board Games, and it's a five-star review. That's a good start. My, my, you know, I'm keeping that in mind for my review of this review. <laughs> and it says, most board game reviewers will tell you what they feel about a game, but won't tell you why. Not so on Decision Space. Jake and Brendan put a ton of effort into understanding and explaining how games work and why they generate such strong feelings. It's especially interesting when they disagree. They must listen to Captain Flip. <laughs> I'd agree with there. <laughs> a must listen for anyone interested in deep understanding of tabletop games. Wow. Thank you so much, Hillside Council, for this super kind review. Yeah, 10 stars out of 10 for me. Thank you. Yeah, 10 out of 10 for me as well. Okay, so Jake, today we're talking progression, and you, you know, we'll pull back the curtain a little bit. Typically, Jake's our editor, and I'll put together notes, and then we, we work on notes together, and Jake does a lot of th things in terms of thinking how the show goes. I don't do a lot of helping with editing, but as we were working, as I was working on the notes for this episode, we kind of chased down these two different threads of what people really mean uh, when they say progression. And Jake, you came up with a really succinct way of summarizing, I think, the two types of progression in board games. Yeah, so this is the way I'm thinking about it at the start of this episode, uh, which is that when people talk about progression, they're really talking about two distinct things. Uh, the first is just progression through the game. So at the start of the game, you're 0% complete. At the end of the game, 100% complete. So there is a literal uh, time progression and sort of of the amount the game is completed that some games do a better job of tracking and orienting players in the time space of the game where they are exactly within that continuum and th so that's the first one kind of a linear time progression through the game and then the second is progression in the game so this is where we get into a little bit more of a nuanced understanding of what it means to feel an agent maybe in an agential way that you're progressing in the game maybe you're powering up maybe you're, the narrative of the game is unfolding in an interesting or novel way uh, and so we'll talk about a bunch of things that make players feel as though they're having progress in a game which is certainly related to but distinct from that linear of progress of time through the game yeah, no, I think that that's really a succinct way. And when both of these things are, are key to feeling a sensation of progress, but feeling it in different ways and maybe a stronger game arc that sits a little bit more clearly in front of the players where you have a sense of when the beginning, middle and end of the game is helps you really experience that progress through the game versus, oh, what? The game just ended out of nowhere. Um, and maybe you don't get to experience that sense of progression. And there's no tr uh, sort of dramatic tension building. But 
the progress in the game. I'm doing things that are meaningfully different by the second half of the game than the first is another really important piece of that puzzle. And I feel like when people talk about maybe say progression systems within a video game, oftentimes they're talking about that progress in the game. And then like you said, I feel like the best analog for progression through the game is just, oh yeah, I'm, I've completed 70% of this game. Or you mentioned Jake before we started recording, Board Game Arena will literally just say your progress is 75% on average through the turns that it takes to play this game yeah. or whatever. Um, and I think that's a that's a key thing as well. But I guess another question might be, as we sort of kick off this conversation, why does this matter? Why do we care about progress at all? And I think that as I'm thinking about it, the first thing that came to mind, as it so often does, is CT wins types of players of why you might play games. So there's striving players who play a game to get better. And then there's achievement players who play games because they want to win those games. And I, I feel like Jake prog- progression and the sense of progression to me feels really important for striving play, right? I care. I want to feel like I'm getting better at playing this game, that I'm struggling against some goal and that I'm overcoming that goal. Um, there, I think to that mindset in terms of how we approach games, progress really matters because progression is feedback about your striving play, right? It shows you, right. look, you've made these improvements in terms of your approach. You're you're doing more things. Yeah, I think it's a really apt kind of thing to layer on top of this conversation because I think we can almost find a distinction there between striving play to get better at a game and achievement play where the goal is winning the game um, to those two distinct things we were talking about at the beginning of the two types of prog- progression. I think you're exactly right that if you're a striving player wanting to uh, overcome a challenge, then perhaps you're more interested in this idea of progress in the game. But if you're an achievement player, right, you're interested in winning, then I think it's possible that the type of player is going to be more interested in the former, or care more about like having a clear sense of where in the game that they are. And yeah. you, you kind of invoked progression systems in video games but there's also a a type of player in video games that wants to like 100 percent the game sure right yeah and that's a different type of progress Progress through the whole game and a progression system right the game will tell you you've got 70 percent of the achievements you know uh and i've got a a good friend of mine who's like i can't even pick up a a, he has to be really careful about a game he picks up because he'll 100 percent everything you know even if it takes like two years of his life to get all every achievement in like a Baldur's Gate or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so there's like a certain genre of games like he won't touch because he knows that about himself or, or yeah. only will after like very careful research. Yeah. And I think that's more of that achievement play, right? right. You're trying to yeah. do everything possible in that game. So you're caring more about, you know, that type of progress to the ultimate end. Yeah. And then if This is a new framework for you, this sort of striving play, achievement play. I don't know that Jake and I are going to talk a ton more about it in depth in this episode, but you should check out episode 67 of Decision Space, where we talk uh, with C.T. Wynn, a game philosopher, uh, a philosopher in general, about his book called Games Agency as Art, where he lays out this framework that we sort of adopted. So again, that's episode 67, over 110 episodes almost to go um, of Decision Space. So check it out for more. But Jake, I think the really cool thing about board games is that board games have to find ways to give players a sense of progression in a comparatively short period of time compared to maybe other longer gameplay experiences, right? Even so comparing to maybe physical games, you mentioned disc golf and kickball or I'll throw in baseball or basketball. The vast majority of sports games have a sense of progression. Um, And you also, you might have progress in the game, right? I'm experiencing getting better at doing something. When I go to play disc golf, I shoot a better score this time than I did last time. That's a sense of progression, but those things take a while to do. A lot of sports take at least 60 minutes, usually longer. Um, And of course, like we're in the realm of board games with sports at 60 minutes, but then a lot of video game experiences, you might put hundreds and hundreds of hours into playing them to get a sense of real progression. So board games almost have to complete this magic trick of giving you a sense of progression in a relatively short period of time for a game. Um, And game designers, tabletop game designers have come out with some really clever tricks of how to do this. So maybe can we start with progress in the game? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I'm excited to kind of talk about ways that games pull off this trick. Um, 
I just one other thing in the prelude, which is I think some games do both, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where it'll be it'll do a really good job of telling you your progress through the game and demonstrating progress in the game. But also some games do just one or the other and not both. And I think that's something that also clues me into the fact that there's like uh, an, an important distinction here to be aware of. Yeah. And potentially neither. You could have a game that doesn't necessarily... It maybe it's a very short game, so it's not super concerned about giving players room to have progress in the game. Right, a rock, um, paper, scissors. You're, there's right. n- there's nothing there. <laughs> yeah. Outside of like maybe you know you're a serious. I understand there are like rock paper scissors tournaments and stuff like sure. that, right? You add a framework. Maybe you're a competitive player, and there's some type of like personal growth that you feel like you're experiencing, like getting yeah. better at the game and reading opponents or whatever. That's something that could always exist in everything. And I think actually falls outside the bounds of this conversation. Like sure. any, like the t- a type of like progression that is purely internal to the player. That is purely, I am improving as, you know, a, a player of, a player this, of game this game. So that yeah. when I'm entering this game a second, third, fourth, hundredth time, yeah. it feels different to me because I've progressed. That's going to be true, I think, of literally every game we would talk about on this podcast ever um yeah that's more how does skill impact my experience of play this is more about how does the game itself help me experience a sense of progression whether it's through game arc or this sort of progressing in the game like an increase in agency or an increase in stakes or power level type stuff yeah so we're probably leaving out all kind of like meta things as well well yeah yeah okay meta from the perspective of Like the game outside the game. Like I'm progressing at Magic the Gathering because I am, you know, have a better sense of like what decks other people are bringing. So I'm going to choose to bring this particular deck to the tournament. Totally, That kind of thing feels right. That's more like a skill thing. Yeah. Which we're not really talking about here. Magic does a good job of giving you a sense of in-game progression by on turn six you can typically cast way stronger spells or put way larger, more menacing creatures on the board than you can on turn one. So you totally. get a nice sense of momentum and arc. Okay, cool. Yeah, all right. All right, so let's do it. Let's talk about some of the ways that we can experience progression in games. How are games okay. achieving this? What are we starting with? Progression in the game. Okay, so what I came up with, Jake, and what jumped to mind for me is the most major way that games make you ex- experience a sensation is an increase in agency so maybe this is an engine building game where you are just your engine is bigger towards the end of the game than it is at the beginning so you're doing more or maybe you get access to new abilities or new effects so maybe you unlock a special power or you get a new item that lets you do something within the game or maybe you in agricola new worker placement spaces open that let you do different things or let you do more fit things this shift in agency um, from what's happening at the beginning of the game to the end helps you feel a sense of progress look at the beginning of the game i could turn one cube into two cubes now i can turn one cube into 22 cubes that feels really different. I feel like I've meaningfully progressed in terms of what I'm doing within the game. Yeah, I think a great example of this is Spirit Island. Mm. You play as sort of a god or a spirit um, that is powering up over the course of the game because you're every turn, you know, taking a token off your board, increasing your power, increasing your income uh, to allow you to play stronger spells or giving you some kind of icon so at the beginning you're doing very little towards the end you know you're combining all the energy you have with the icons you've had to like double and triple power your uh the the spells you're using on your turn so it gives you a real sense of like i can just do so much more to manipulate the state of the board yeah and interestingly in spirit island too you have this buildup happening across the table from you as well where the colonial forces that you're fighting against as a spirit are getting stronger, they're taking over more of the island. I think that maybe falls a little bit more into the second category too, this like prog- progress through the game where you, you're you watching the stakes rising in that sense, but you're sort of seeing, okay, I have to progress and make sure I'm progressing in terms of the the cards that I'm utilizing and the effects that I've unlocked so I can meet the needs of the threat that's in front of me. Totally. Another way, and this is, I think, sort of the same thing, but or at least adjacent, and it's 
increase in stakes or power level. So what came to mind for me, Jake, is sometimes you'll have games that have these progressive deck systems, right? So maybe it's Seven Wonders where there's three different ages and the cards in each of the decks that you use in each of those ages get a little stronger each time. The number of points you're getting from playing a card in Seven Wonders in the third age are are significantly more than in the first stage. So there's this buildup, there's this sense of progression. Um, Challengers is another game that comes to mind, right? If I could choose to start the game with three cards from deck C, I would do that every time instead of choosing cards from deck A if I could, right? You have this ramp up in power level that gives you a sense of progress as you're making your deck better because no matter what you add from deck C, it's almost always going to make your deck better. Yeah, definitely. I, I like this as a distinction too, because I think the first category we're talking about increase in agency can yeah. be mapped almost directly on top of a waxing decision space game. Totally. Right. Where if, if you feel uh, on your turn, as you progress through the game that you have more options, there are more things you can do um, that almost always is going to achieve this sense of progression. But I think here, it's subtle, but the distinction is that like challengers is such a great example because you are powering up your deck, but you're actually not your your agency. Uh, the de- the decision space is not waxing. You're still looking between the same number of cards. You're still just flipping cards off the top of your deck as you resolve the battle. Um, so it gives you a great sense of progression through the card powers, though it's not actually giving you more choice. Yeah. Yeah. Another game. So other games that come to mind, and I'm curious if where you think this fits, Jake. Um, And I think it probably fits towards more progress through the game, but I'm reminded of games like Dominion, where you kind of mix these two things. So Dominion is a deck building game where you're trying to add new cards to your deck, similar to Challenger's or at least somewhat similar. Um, And then eventually you have to add these victory point cards, these green cards that don't do anything, but they give you victory points. And they only count if they're in your deck at the end of the game. So you have this, this tension between making progress in the game, adding real cards in your deck that are making your deck better, and but next to, in Dominion, making progress through the game, building up, getting enough money in your deck, your deck's gotten, you've made enough progress in it that you can name, progress t- through the game and buy those victory point cards, the estates and the duchies that you're putting in your deck. So Dominion is a negotiation bet- and the tension between progressing in the game enough that you feel like you can push to the end and progress through the game and force the game to end. I think that's a really interesting way in which that game has a driving sense of momentum because it's asking players to make decisions that directly impact both their progress in the game and their progress through the game at the same time. And not all games let you do that. Totally. Yeah, I think deck building games are sort of like a marquee example of this type of progression um, because it just works so well on both accounts. It'd be difficult to think of a deck building game that doesn't have a sense of like, I'm getting stronger cards that are going into my deck. Right. Um, and you're, you're more often than not, those stronger cards are also uh, going to increase your agency on your turn when you get the chance to play them because it'll allow you to do more or buy bigger and better cards or even more cards or whatever. But it doesn't, to the Dominion point, it doesn't have to be the case that just because you're able to spend a ton of money and buy a extremely powerful card, maybe that's like the most valuable point card in Dominion, um, that doesn't necessarily increase your agency, despite the fact that it's like a powerful card to buy at the end of the game. Yeah, completely. Dominion is a cool example. Um, And beyond that, it just makes me think of other games in the way that they try to achieve a sense of progression without having any mechanisms that increase agency or increase the stakes slash power level. So one example of that is maybe a round structure in games like Modern Art comes to mind where, okay, so you don't have a change in agency really. Maybe you have more money so you can bid more, but you're doing the same things. Modern Art is this uh, bidding auction game by Rainer Knizia in which you're buying and selling paintings and trying to have the most money at the end of the game. But what you do have is the paintings are worth more later in the game, potentially. So there's this sense of, wow, my decisions are even more impactful at the end of the game. 
I yeah. really need to time my purchasing decisions and my selling decisions right to maximize the value of each. Yeah, I think I think that's that's definitely right. The stake stakes being higher can increase regardless of decision space increasing yeah. as well. I think modern art is a good example of that, right? Paintings just by virtue of the way the auction works is are inherently going to be worth more at the end. Uh, or at least you'll know that, right? Than, right. Than at the beginning. Um, yeah. I, I just thought of a really good example for the deck building thing, so I just have to say it, which is uh, Dune Imperium, where you can buy the Spice Must Flow cards at the end, which are super expensive, but give you like one of the 10 victory points needed. Mm, uh, for, interesting. So, you know, you're giving up a ton of purchasing power, but you're still like buying this Securing really a point. Powerful card. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so those are sort of the progression in the game mechanisms. So the other ways that we that's we're going to pivot, we're going to move from talking about progression in the game to progression through the game now, and yeah. some of the ways that games accomplish this. I think this first one we're going to talk about to me, this like just straddles the midpoint. Sure, I think it kind of fits well in both categories. Okay, and that's narrative progression or campaign progression, um, because I I think when people talk about feeling progression in a game, they're talking about everything we've we've talked about. But I think because of the way the word is used outside the board game context, like a narrative progression, a char- like character progression, progression character yeah. development, like there's a sense of like story and thematic elements unfolding in a game yeah. that gives players a sense of progression. Like if you yeah. think about like a, uh, and it doesn't have to be like a campaign book. Like we're reading a story. Uh, we play this game. Then we open the the rule book or the campaign book and see what happens. That changes things. When we play the next one. It could be more natural and emergent than that. If you think of epic games like Dune or Twilight Imperium, I think a big part of the reason why so many people love that is because they're feeling progression, of course, in the ways that we were just talking about. Um, of like you know your your power and influence is growing or whatever but also like there's a story that is told and changes over the course of play that to me feels like like because the story is happening right like it does inherently mean progression through the game but also like i think it brings people in uh and kind of straddles that line where it it kind of evokes a more of a like a feeling of progression in the game as opposed to just like getting to the end Hmm. that's really interesting so maybe you've built up a position that within some maybe like area control game you've invested a ton of resources into building up and because of the narrative consequences of okay jake's invested a ton of resources in this one pivotal decision you feel like the sort of arc and the narrative that we as players put onto it gives us a cleaner sense of progression where you sort of see this building up And then we see the consequences of that. And then us being able to fit that gameplay experience into a narrative, the sort of narrative equity of play gives us a sense of progression because we're mapping a story to it. Is that kind of? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And I think this fits best with like those kind of epic longer games just because it gives it more room to breathe and unfold. Yeah. Um, Where... You know, it is possible that, oh, Brendan started out super strong and, you know, he he was in an alliance with Jared, but then the rest of the table kind of teamed up and, you know, took Brendan down to almost nothing, Uh, you know, but then, you know, Jared was kind of dominating the table and kind of got taken down. And by the end, Brendan almost came all the way back and was like vying for victory, like once again, like that kind of thing. It needs just a lot of time Time. to grow, but when you come to the end of the game and you feel like you can tell that kind of story, um, I think it gives players like a big sense of like kind of a narrative progression, yeah. which to yeah. me feels more like progression in a game as opposed to like through, True. but it definitely straddles. The, that's why I think it kind of straddles the line for Both. me. Yeah. Then there's the literal progression through say a campaign game where right. we're playing my late, my city there's 24 unique scenarios that we can play and every time we play a new one i feel a little bit like i'm progressing through playing that game but i think the reason why my city goes beyond that it's a game both jake and i really love we love the eternal game we also really like the legacy game which i'm really referring to right now is that there's this ramp up in terms of the complexity of mechanisms as you move through that game that gives you 
I feel a sense of progress. If the game was getting simpler over time, I think you might still feel this sense of progression through the game. Okay, I'm advancing through, but I don't think it would be emphasized as much as it is in my city where, yes, it's not the most complex legacy game ever, but what the game's asking you to do is significantly like proportionally more complicated given the game set systems overall at the end than it is at the beginning. And I think that gives you a real sense of progress too. When you look down and you say, oh, the first puzzle, I was just thinking about this things. And now I'm look at this long list of all the things I'm considering. It's giving you that progression through the game and maybe even progression in the game in terms of the mechanisms that are at play. So like you're saying, Jake, I guess I'm arriving at the same conclusion that these these types of progressions are, are linked. There's tricks that game designers yeah. utilize that make us experience both. Totally. Like when you're, you finish game five in Pandemic Legacy or whatever, yeah. you're like, we are 50% through the sure. game. Or I guess yeah. that'd be game six if it's you sure. play one year. Um, and you just, you know that and you're like, wow. Or, right, you're playing Gloomhaven and you finish your sixth scenario and you're like, wow, we are 3% through this game. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Right. Um, that's definitely happening. I think the like ramping up in complexity is kind of a magic trick that yeah. designers are using because to me that does kind of invoke what we were talking about before, which is like your own competency. Right. Like we are able, you know, by adding in more and more rules complexity by the end, it makes you feel as though you've learned how to play the game better because all those rules would have felt more complex at the beginning, the beginning. thrown in. Yeah. Um, so I think that is like, it definitely makes you feel like you're progressing in the game for sure. But I think yeah. it's sort of playing a little bit on another aspect of like self-improvement, right? We've yeah. talked on this podcast before about there's there seems to be an a tendency of players when they start going deep into the board game hobby of like wanting to play heavier and heavier games yeah. and i think a legacy game satisfies that itch you know in the course of one game to some extent because you're like yeah. at the beginning we weren't able to do this and now look at us go totally okay so what's an example i'm gonna come i'm gonna state an example of just progress through the game there's okay. no progression in the game in this game and that's can't stop can't stop is a push your luck dice game i am just a good at rolling the dice in the beginning as I am at the end. I do I have no agency in terms of as a player within the game, the game is giving me no new tools. It might be shifting what what outs I have based on my progress through the game. But I think that Can't Stop gives you a real sense of tension and progression just by saying, okay, once you get the to a top to the top of a uh, of one of these columns, you can stop. And then you can lock in that progress. And that does give you a sense of progress, right? It feels like a meaningful milestone when you get to the top of a column and can't stop. And you say, okay, I can stop now. I finally got to the end. And it kind of, because you're, the end goal is getting to the top of three of them, you get this sort of really nice beginning, middle, end of your progress through the game structure, just pasted onto the game. Um, but again, it's not as if there's any mechanism within the game that makes it easier to roll the dice at the end, right? It's not as if every turn that goes around the table, we add one new die that's giving right. us more options or something like that. That is not in Can't Stop. It's just about our progress through the game, but you feel it and you know, you know, as two players are three quarters of the way up their final column in a game, you have the tension of this like climactic story coming to a close. Totally. Yeah. And, and that would be similar to saying like, we're going to play rock, paper, scissors, best three out of five. Sure. Like, you yeah. know, you're getting closer to the end of the game, but certainly the decision space agency, everything exactly else is same. staying exactly the same. And I think yep. that's interesting because that's a, you know, a progression towards an end goal um, where I think mostly you would find that, you know, nobody's, selling you a game that's as simple as rock paper scissors or at least you know we're not talking about that on this podcast um you know games that are that feather light but most often to answer your question of like a game that has only progression through and not progression in would be like extreme waning decision space games like something like hey that's my fish mm. right where you're doing the same thing on every turn. And the only thing that's changing is there's like fewer and fewer spaces on the board. Yeah. I even think, you know, there are 
some very slight ways that you might feel like you're progressing in a game of Castles of Burgundy. But even a game like that, I think is almost purely on the progression through the game standpoint. Outside of maybe some of the special buildings like, that you get. You that get the science abilities. buildings. I yeah. think that's kind of the thing that makes it like, okay, I can, I'm, but even those are so slight generally. It's like, this yeah. is worth a few more points to me. So like, I'm better at building the docks than somebody yeah. else, like whatever. Uh, yeah. But generally, you know, you're just doing the same thing on your turn. But that game still has, to me, a great sense of progression because it because the board does such a good job of orienting you at all times exactly where in the game you're at, right? Yep. You've got five uh, overall eras or ages or whatever, and then five turns within each of those. You lay out the five tiles that will mark each round every turn. So you could say, like, we're in, you know, era B on the third turn of it, you know, and yeah. you can always immediately know where you're at in the game. So you feel the whole time, like you're progressing through the game rapidly. Um, and I, and I think to me, that's like a great example of, you know, how if your game doesn't have that kind of agency building, yeah. uh, increasing stakes, increasing power levels at the end, like to me, it's really important that you're giving your players you know, it's not one size fits all, but in like a Euro game kind of context, I think it's really important that you're giving your players something else to orient themselves uh, to cement the the fact that they feel like they're really making moving progress. through yeah. something, making progress through the game in, in a different way. Yeah. Another example that comes to mind for me, Jake, of a game style that has more progression through the game than progression in the game. So we talked about how waxing decision space games gives you that real sense of progression in the game. But a more static decision space, maybe say a game like Battlecon, where it's a tabletop fighting game, and you have a set deck of options, those options are always the same at the beginning and the end, you, you don't have as much progression in the game, you have real progression through the game as you land hits on your opponent, and you chip away their, their HP. But I think that within those games, there's characters that are designed that have things like meter, where you can build up to these larger effects. And I think that within sort of the arc of fighting game genre design, going back to the very beginning of that genre, which was like more popular in video games, it's you got these meter systems where you build up over time and then you unlock new moves, I think to give you a sense of progression in the game. So you don't just have the progression through the game. So it kind of becomes the jelly to the peanut butter of a genre that's more about peanut butter to yeah. give a really confusing analogy right at the end. Um, but then some games like board games, I think can lean in either direction, right? So another example of a game that has a real sense of progression, but doesn't really have any progression in the game is a game like Blue Lagoon. This is a Reiner Canizia tile lane game. Every turn is exactly the same. You're going to put down a tile somewhere on the board in an empty space. And because you're never really changing what you're doing, or you're never changing how you're doing what you're doing, you just do the same thing every turn throughout the game. What does change is halfway through the game, you take all the pieces off the board except for a few special uh, sort of hut house buildings uh, that you placed in the first round, and then you play again. And that sort of gives you this sense of progression where the first half of the game does feel meaningfully different than the second because of the small rules change and this game arc progression. In Blood Rage, another example, that's a game with the progressive deck systems. Um, so it gets progress that way. But then also the board gets smaller as you play. Regions get destroyed and it forces you into smaller and smaller areas. So you feel an increase of stakes as you're fighting for territory with your opponents and there's less territory that's available to move into. Yeah, I think this is where that, like the adversary board in Spirit Island comes in. Yeah. Um, you know, your personal board, that's progression in the game. And then the adversary board is what's, you know, telling you your progression through the game as, you know, your opponent, you know, the nation that you're fighting against is growing their influence on the board, their ability to disrupt your plans uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, which yeah. I think gives that game such a nice sense of both. And, yep. you know, maybe a thesis here is that games that do both well um, are games that have like the strongest sense of progression 
of all. And I think yeah. Spirit Island really demonstrates that. I think that's one of the things that people love most about this game and has led to it being one of the you know most successful cooperative games out there, most highly thought of, because you really feel a sense of progression coming through. Um, and I think it's because it's hitting hitting it on both sides of the equation really hard. Yeah. And then even outside of the, what we're talking about in this discussion, there's a lot of meta progression in that game where you can take on different challenges Right. And sort of set your own. Right. You feel like you're level. able to get better too. Right. I played, I played against Prussia on level whatever. And yeah, I feel, yeah. But okay. So other, I think maybe now is a natural time in this discussion, Jake, just to talk about some examples that we enjoy and why we enjoy them and maybe characterize them as being progression in the game or progression through the game. So a game for me that came to mind is this perfect example of Euro progression um, is Great Western Trail. Great, Great Western Trail is this simple game where you have a, a hand of cow cards and you're trying to move your little cowboy uh, through a board on this loop to make a delivery in Kansas City or potentially send them off further along. So you're always doing the same thing. You're moving your unit, your little worker, your little cowboy through the map, trying to get to the same point where you do a drop off and you measure how strong your hand is at the end. But how this game gives you a sense of progression is you have this increase in agency Every time you go around, depending on what strategy you take, you might be putting stronger buildings on the board that only you can use. They're letting you do more more novel effects. You can move more spaces, or maybe you can you gain more money, or maybe you uh, get to buy better cows and add those stronger cows to your deck. There's certainly a, a quality of just numbers get bigger is, is yeah. one of the ways that progression happens in games. And I think Great Western Trail is really good at that, but then they also will change your agency. Maybe towards the end of the game, you just get to flat out remove for free some of some obstacles that are on the board. And that feels really powerful because previously I was always having to give up resources to do it, and now I just do it for free. Um, but this game also at the same time has an increase in stakes where you get higher victory points for deliveries later in the game. If you can show up with enough cows to make make sort of a, a higher delivery possible. So I think as you play, it sort of feels like you're playing the carnival game where you're smashing a hammer to try to ring a bell. You know, you're trying to ring the New York bell as hard as you can with your your hammer being the hand of cow cards that you have. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I just, Great Western Trail is a game where you finish the game, you look down, you say, wow, this word looks so different at the end than it did at the beginning. And I think that's another telltale sign of progression in or potentially through the game as you just look down and you say wow look what we've done yeah it's such a great example because i think one thing that gives you a sense of progression is context of like sure. remember where we were at the beginning yeah and great western trail really lets you experience that right because you're looping the same board you know several times many times yeah. throughout the course of the game um so you kind of get that like sense of like remember when that first time we were hardly able to do anything and i sold yeah. cows for like four dollars yeah uh, and now i'm selling cows for 24 dollars yep right and yeah. it, you have that like context within the same game yeah um it takes five turns to move through the board and now it takes me two right, right. exactly yeah. uh now i'm just going so crazy with this strategy yeah um and i i think a lot of games do that right uh but here and that and, and when i say that is like you're doing the same gameplay loop yep of some yeah. type but this makes that loop a literal thing yeah it's a literal on the loop. board yeah yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> that you're good. running through versus like you know we're talking about progression through like a legacy game like my city that's kind of doing the same thing on like a larger time scale like yeah. when you're doing the crazy stuff in you know the seventh you know episode of the game or whatever you still are playing on that same board now covered up with a bunch of stickers and stuff but you're kind of like you know we've you, you're seeing like all that con you're, you've got the context still because you still have that same board that's been like built upon yeah, I think that Tigris and Euphrates is a game that comes to mind with me for me that achieves progression in a different way than some of these games. Um, Tigris and Euphrates is another Kinesia tiling game. Dude, is Kinesia the master of progression? Progression? I don't know. Maybe I was going to say sometimes for me the cool thing about Tigris and Euphrates is that the progression comes in different ways. Some yeah. games you feel progression because you build these monuments that are risky to put onto the board, and you look down and you say, "Wow, just 
points are gushing onto this table. But other games, you play through Tigers and Euphrates and no one builds a monument at all. And your sense of progression comes from the fact that there's these treasures seated onto the board. And one of the game end conditions is they get taken off. So your sense of progression is you look down and you say, oh my gosh, almost all the treasures are gone. This game has really progressed. It's almost over. And then it also has this effect of it's a game that starts with essentially no pieces on the board. And then by the end, you filled it with tiles. Yeah. It's one of those games. I was thinking about this earlier too. Um, that is not a four hour epic board game yeah. experience, but does have, you know, at its best, a sense of that kind of like narrative progression of like, you know, one kind of player getting a big foothold and then maybe they're like attacked and then that kind of crumbles and they're, you know, now relegated to just like a small section of the board, right? Yeah. Kind of like that rise and fall of empire thing. Right. I think that's something that could be like, you know, some people would ascribe to Tigris and Euphrates as like pulling that off better than a lot of more complicated, longer playing games even. Yeah. Another game that does this really well in sort of a short time frame for me, Jake, that jumped to mind almost immediately was Raiders of the North Sea. Yeah. In, in the episode where we covered this game, we talked about how the board is literally laid out with spaces that kind of function as a beginning, middle and end. So when you start the game, you look to the top of the board and you sort of say, oh, we're going to build up to the point where I can raid those locations. Um, and you you feel it. It ramps up to those. You maybe get to go to those end game, more or less, raids once or twice. But you have a sense of progression. You even, in that game, you start with these weaker workers and you try to trade into stronger workers that let you utilize different spots. Um, and I think that's a game with a real sense of progression, both in terms of progression in the game and progression through the game. And it links them at, at the same time in terms yeah. of what you're doing. Yeah, totally. Yeah, great example. Um, I, I think there's a, a ton of games that we could cite that does this really well. Um, you know, a game like an Age of Innovation, right, where you're any game that has you kind of like upgrading your personal player board, kind of yeah. the scythe mechanism of moving a piece off your player board that then is like unlocking your power is is doing a really neat progression in two ways right i'm progressing here on the board and i'm progressing in my power and ability yeah. to influence the board so i think that works really well especially in and then in game innovation two you've got you know your five round markers each round is a little bit different in like what you're hoping to achieve in that round um does a really good job a game like findorf uh does yeah. a great job of you've got a you know, a, a railroad that is being built out over the middle of the game that is doing both things in a really neat way. It's both indicating your progress through the game because as soon as these two rails are completely built, that's the end of the game. But as that rail is built, it's actually also uh, changing the economy of the game. At first, it's, you know, adding or taking away peat from the market, making your peat more valuable to sell in. And then it's adding peat to kind of demonstrating it's both changing your decision space, but also demonstrating a narrative change that like the city is becoming industrialized. And now Pete isn't the main thing we're using to like power the city anymore. Yeah. Um, Findorf yeah. jumped to mind for me too, Jake, just because it, I think it does progression in the game and progression through the game wonderfully. So because it's this Rondell engine building game, one of the core mechanisms is you have these four abilities that you use. And a part of the game is you make them better. You look down at the, your board at the start and what you can do, and it's relatively small. But a part of the gameplay loop is you add these little pieces to your player board that says, when I take this action, I do it two times instead of once. Or when I do this action, I do it three times instead of once. So when you look down, you just feel like, wow, look how much I could potentially do. But then also, it has a literal timeline in the game because it's representing building an actual city where actual buildings were built in these different years, you can look down and say, okay, how far have we progressed in time? And I think that that's a, a really neat mechanism too. And it has this cool cost discounting mechanism where if certain buildings aren't built by the time that they were actually built in the real world, you get a discount. So sort of ludologically, it's willing these buildings into, a, the ex into existence within the game in the way that they around when they came into being in the real world version of Findorf. And I think that that's what gives you a really cool sense of progression. Yeah, one more that I wanted to say, um, and this is uh, another Knizia game, um, yeah. is the quest for Eldorado. And another uh, deck building game. It's another deck building game. And I think 
what this one does so awesome is you're racing, right? You yeah. see the finish line from the beginning. So the further players advance across the board, that is doing the progress through the game yeah. really well for you. I can see how close everybody is to the finish line. Yeah. Uh, but then also with the deck building is giving you that sense of like powering up and like building out your own characters kind of like identity, right? What are you going to be good at? What are you going to struggle with? Uh, Also, the challenge of the game increases as you go through the boards, meaning it can be, uh, you can find yourself in spaces where it's like more difficult to traverse through. You need more, uh, you know, rowing power, more oars or, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, So I think it's a game that gives you just, you know, progression however you like it. Um, and, And, you know, it, it feel and because of that it like feels like a game that just has such a sense of downhill momentum like as soon yeah. as you start playing it's just uh, you everybody is a, a snowball rolling down the hill and seeing who's crossing the finish line first yeah race games are a perfect example here where if you're playing heat okay it's a three round it's a three lap race and okay, I have this many spaces to the finish line. It just makes progression through the game perfectly evident. And I think that that plays out in other games where we were talking about the more stilted ways, right? With like round structures give you a sense of progression. So in games with rounds, maybe you don't have to worry about the progression as much. But if you take rounds away, which some people really like board games that don't have rounds in them because they feel more organic, they feel more fluid. Maybe if you're designing a game without the sort of more structured progression of of a round structure you need to find other ways to create beats within the game that players can sort of see and say okay we've made this much progress towards the end i think i have roughly this long before it ends because it can feel really deflating to spend an hour and 45 minutes of your life working towards the end of a game and not know that oh and then just having it feel somewhat randomly like it ends out of the blue you want to have a sense we like arcs so if a game doesn't have the sort of built-in structure of rounds, what's that game doing to give you another sense? And I think another area, a type of game where I don't feel a ton of progression outside of progression through the game are spatial puzzles. So I put Isle of Cats down as an example. I feel real progression through the game in Isle of Cats, right? My, it's kind of like a race game. My boat is filling up with cats, these polyomino cats, and I'm running out of space. So, I, But I don't necessarily feel like I have a lot of progression in the game in a game like Isle of Cats, maybe a little yeah. bit. I get some more baskets so I can get a few more cats or whatever. Yeah, um, I think that's exactly no right. Yeah. Um, even even a game like, uh, hey, that's my fish too, feels like just so spatially oriented, yeah. right? Um, that similarly, yeah, there's no real progression in the game. Yeah. Um, I, another one I wanted to mention too, and I feel like this might be a game, case of a game game mechanism that does neither and yet remains fun and that's trick-taking games i'm curious to hear your take on this um where yeah of basically any game that just says like play x rounds yeah uh if the game is giving you like a lot of latitude to decide how many rounds you want to play it or it's just like maybe play like once for every player in the game but it's fine if you do more fine if you do less like that to me is kind of indicating a game that probably doesn't have a lot of either of these things, Things, right? You don't really feel a sense of progression through the game outside of like, you know, maybe if you say at the beginning, this is how many rounds we're going to do, then sure, you're okay, we're 25%, 50%, 75% done. Um, But that's kind of it. And you're playing your hand out and you might have like some kind of uh, waning decision space there. But again, very rare. And of course, trick taking games are being, you know, I don't know about arcs. Maybe that's totally different or whatever. And, you know, there's all kinds of uh, waxing decision space that's happening there. Uh, clearly, you can use this mechanism all types of way. But like, if you think of just like your traditional trick taking card game, Brendan, to me, that feels like games that don't have much sense of progression. Yeah, I agree. Obviously, you have a progression through the hand, but the sort of ways in which that's waning it doesn't feel progressive in the same way, you know, yeah, it doesn't and, feel like you're advancing necessarily. And I think there's benefits to that too. You know, not yeah. every single game needs to feel like 
this kind of like epic story that's unfolding in front of you or that like you're becoming a more powerful person or, you know, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when we had Pete on to talk about trick taking games, one thing he said is he loves about trick taking games is there are these games that provide space for you to like play, but also chat and hang out with people around the table. Um, and I think maybe that is benefited like that kind of social aspect of a game um if not requires is benefited by a game that does not have a sense of progression sure because i think the more you feel like you're progressing the more you feel things are ramping up that will naturally lead to like a more stilted uh conversation at points of the game when things are getting like really intense Tense. at the table yeah. um so you know what i mean i think that's kind of like the flip side of the coin of feeling progression in games. It kind of yeah. might reduce the social yeah. aspect outside of the play. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think within the trick-taking games too, Jake, we talked about how an increase in the stakes of the what's going on in the game can make you feel like there's progress. And sometimes at the end of a trick-taking hand, you have no agency left. You're just playing out the cards and you're not yeah. making a ton of decisions. And I think that's another reason why you don't always it might not feel like there's a lot of progression going on. As One thing sort of I just thought of too, I want to add this in about trick-taking games because I think it fits in a broader context too. I think one thing that makes trick-taking games feel particularly like they lack progression is the fact that there's downtime between yeah. rounds, right? You're right. taking up all the cards, you're shoveling them and dealing and that like takes you out of the experience of play. Yeah, you're, I, you're I in think, that same exact loop. Right, and I think when you know, in order for a game to have, you know, feel both progression through, but also maybe more importantly, progression in the game. Like if you're taking breaks, pulls you out of that yeah. feeling of yep. progress. One thing that would change that if you shuffled in a, a new value of cards every time. So you have this sort of like ascending effect or something. Maybe that could give you a sense of progress. Right. If you were trying yeah. to do something like that. A hundred percent. So yeah. Anyway, interesting. That is really interesting. Um, do you have, maybe as we close, Jake, any examples of mechanisms of progress in games that you want to sort of highlight that jump to mind? And I'll give you a second to think, and I have two small ones that I, I think are really fun. So one is, there was this Magic the Gathering set that came out a few years ago that was based on Dungeons and Dragons. It's Quest in the Forgotten Realms or something. And there were these neat enchantments that were based on classes. So there was the cleric class or the fighter class. And this is so simple. But a neat progression mechanism that goes with them is you would cast these enchantments and then they were mana sinks. So you could spend on a future turn, maybe you spend a few mana and you level up the effect. So you become a better fighter. And what that means within the game is you unlock this new effect where maybe now, I don't remember what that class does exactly, but you can imagine, right? Like all of your characters get plus two plus zero. Then you do it again. All of your all of your creatures get trampled. Then you do it again. All of your creatures gain double strike and you have this sense of, of real progression on this little journey that this single cards have given you. And then another one that I could think of was you mentioned on the show a long time ago, this sort of obscure Antoine Bowser game, Samurai Spirit, a co-op black jackish um, samurai game. That's not all that notable. If you've never heard of this game, do not be surprised. I don't think Jake or I would endorse it as an amazing game, but it has this really neat mechanism where the if you get low enough on HP, your samurai can transform and you flip your character sheet, your character tile board, uh, and it transforms into this anthropomorphic version of yourself. And I found that that's a really cool progression mechanism where you have this physical component that at some point in the game you get to flip, you see this transformation, this sense of progress, you can do more, um, and it denotes, oh, we're at this high stakes moment in the game. So that one's always stuck with me. Despite not loving the game, I really love that mechanism. Yeah. Dang, I feel like I kind of spoiled some of mine. Like I yeah, really think okay. like the the Findorf one is clever. And I think one thing I would just like to highlight, I guess one more time if you're thinking about designing a game is sometimes the progression elements that I think are most clever are just simply the ones that give players a visual of that progress through the game. Yeah. Like I think Castles of Burgundy would be such a lesser game if it didn't on the board just give players a clear representation of where they are uh, within the time span of the game yeah. at all times. Um, and, you know, not all games do that. And I think 
especially in the Euro game space, right? And if, if your game has a set number of rounds and turns, then I think it's almost always would be worth doing. Um, and and it's, it's something that just gives players like a better sense of like the clarity of the decision space in the game and, and often at no cost at all besides like a small visual representation. Uh, totally. So there's a ton of games that do this really well. Um, and, and some that like surprisingly don't and it makes things feel a little bit more. I, I think it's like the clarity of decision space. Like it makes things feel a little bit more muddled um, and difficult to parse. Yeah. Well, this has been a very interesting progressive conversation in my mind. I'm really thankful to have the framework of progression in the game and progression through the game that you've sort of succinctly laid out here, Jake. And I, as I play games, I think I'll be thinking about the way in which different mechanisms help evoke these different types of progress and feel. Um, and just something for me to noodle on. If you have examples of mechanisms you think accomplish one of these ways in which we experience progression in games really well, I'd love to hear about them. And one of the ways you could let us know is by talking to us in our Discord, where you could find a link to it in our show notes or on our website, decisionspacepodcast.com. Yeah, and if you're still listening to this show at this point, we're counting on dedicated listeners such as yourself to help spread the word about our show. The best way you could do that is by leaving us a review somewhere or just simply tell your game group about Decision Space and you may, maybe you'll turn them into a new listener. Thank you all so much for listening to this week's episode. We want to thank Hembry as always for our intro and outro song, Reach Out, and we'll see you next week. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.